Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And that thin line between parody and reality is never thinner than when looking at some of the comments. I, I, I think this is serious. Just a little throwback to the conversation in the last hour. This fellow's blaming Esther Ranson for the collapse of discipline, presumably when she founded Childline and gave children a place they could go to report abuse. That's when all the problems started. Went to school in the 60s and 70s. We had respect. Esther Ranson spoiled it. Kids nowadays, no discipline, no respect. Bring back the cane. Fear makes a great controller. Go on, should we have a look at some other texts this person has sent in? just to see what, what sort of hymn sheet they're singing from. When Pakistan, spelt with the R, has a space programme, why are the UK giving foreign aid to them? Our health service short of equipment and has been for quite a few years. Huh. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, I think we, we get the picture. Turn your attention next to matters of foreign sales, specifically Saudi Arabia. I, quite a lot of the... Uh, it is going to sound incredibly... Um, Actually, it's not going to sound rude. It's just true. I guess if you don't like it, it might strike you as rude, but it's just true. I've, quite a lot of the sort of lazy right-wing responses to events, I, I can get my head around. I can understand them. I, I, for example, you know, indulging fear is very, very powerful. Fear is probably the most powerful emotion that we have. It keeps us alive our ability to feel fear. It is, you know, what drives flight or fight chemical reactions. But the, the, the emotional backdrop of fear is probably defined more uh, human behaviour over the generations than anything else. More than love, I would argue, even. Uh, in fact, you can knit the two together. Fear of losing something you love will make you do crazy, crazy things. So, yeah, if you have people pandering to fear, doing a little bit of scaremongering, um, I understand why it works. I really do. But there's one little area where the, the lazy right-wing response... It seems to me to be lazy. We may discover in the course of this hour that it's a much more sophisticated and, and, and thought through and nuanced worldview than I'd realised. But when we talk about regimes like Saudi Arabia and the bad that they do, the, the, the harm that they do, in this case, I'm looking at the United Nations drawing or trying to draw attention to the what they describe. Well, actually, our own Ministry of Defence okay, has, has described staggering violations of humanitarian law by Saudi coalition forces in Yemen. Those Saudi coalition forces are supported by um, British and American weaponry. Indeed, it, it's been kind of proved that stuff we sold has been employed in the commission of what can only really be described as, as either war crimes or staggering violations of humanitarian law. There, there are two sides to the Yemeni civil war. Uh, it's important to remember this. I, I, I do think so much of our attitude to international relations is informed by the Second World War, and that's so unhelpful. The Second World War, pretty much the clearest case in living memory of good versus evil. I, I know it was even more nuanced than that, but when the full extent of the Nazi project became clear, I, I, I guess until the last couple of years, most of us could not even conceive of circumstances in which you'd want to be on that side of the, of the fight. You know, the side that rejects humanity, the side that believes people should be judged differently according to the religion that their parents were um, uh, subscribing to when they were born. People who think that your geographical or your ethnic origins should define your rights. I mean, in the case of the Nazis, the right to live. In the case of the far right these days, it's just your right to travel or your right to engage in certain practices. Certain freedoms will be denied to you according to where you were born. So that was clear, and we've, I, I'm guilty. I'm so guilty of this. I always presume there's a good side and a bad side in a war. But there hardly ever is. Uh, there's, there's atrocities on both sides in Yemen. The way the media brings the stories to us, the way the world is shaken down, it, 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 it portrays the aggressor, if you will, or the biggest force as the aggressor. And, and I mean, Saudi Arabia is guilty of these offences, these violations, but the um, but the civil war also has pretty vicious and vile things being done by the other side. I just want to get that out there. It's a sectarian tribal war, and uh, as ever, they're, they're bloody and nasty. But we're focusing on Saudi Arabia today, because the line that I sometimes hear on, on sort of question time or something like that, it, it seems to me to be, yes, obviously, by signing off 
3.3 billion pounds worth of arms exports to Saudi Arabia since the start of its offensive. So that's just since this latest civil war, since the latest intervention. Yeah, obviously, by doing that, we are actually enabling war criminals. We are actually enabling war crimes. Yeah, by signing off 3.3 billion pounds worth of exports to Saudi since the start of the offensive, we are complicit in what our own Ministry of Defense has described as staggering violations of humanitarian law. And the lazy, I think the lazy right-wing response to this is, yeah, okay, so we're, we're, we're helping them, we're helping them murder thousands of people, we're helping them violate humanitarian law, but if we didn't make 3.3 billion quid out of it, somebody else would? And, and you hear that argument, and you think, don't you, 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 re, re, you, you just look up from your dinner and press pause on the telly, did I just hear that right? You might as well have state-sanctioned crack cocaine dealing, if that's the moral logic of selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. Well, if we didn't do it, someone else do it. Someone else would. All right, okay, I'm going to sell porn to your children. And if you stop me from doing it, someone else is going to do it. It's it, it, quite staggering lack of gumption, both moral and intellectual. And yet that's, at this point, that's the only argument I ever hear. And maybe I'm mishearing. Maybe I've got wax in my ears. But maybe I haven't. Maybe you've heard that argument yourself. Yeah, all right. War crimes. Yeah, yeah, all right. United Nations. Yeah, all right. Staggering violations of humanitarian law. But 3.3 billion quid, dudes. Hey, you know? 3.3 billion. Sovs. We're going to have to keep, keep selling the stuff to these criminals. Nine minutes after 11 is the time. I want you to tell me what you think about that. That's all. I, I'm not picking a side on this. I, I, I completely recognise the moral greyness. We've been discussing it for years on this programme. The notion of Robin Cook, the late Robin Cook's ethical foreign policy. How long is it since we did that? That We did a whole show, I think, a whole three hours. It was only supposed to be ten minutes. Just examining the impossibility of an ethical foreign policy because in some circumstances you're going to have to choose between the lesser of two evils. You can't choose good. I think like an ethical foreign policy. Why do we sell weapons to Saudi Arabia? Well, because if we didn't, somebody else would. Are you morally comfortable with that? 03456060973. You keep your enemies close, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer? I, I've seen footage when I present Newsnight. Um, my colleague Gabriel Gatehouse has made some films in Yemen that, they, well, I'm a snowflake, so I'll tell you, they're going to haunt me for the rest of my life, some of the stuff I've seen on the screen that he's, he's and his producer have brought back from that part of the world. It, it's absolutely staggering, and it's happening in other parts of the world as well. And when it is proven, in many ways, beyond doubt, that we are selling them stuff that facilitates some of these violations, that's the kind of thing that should have us questioning what British values are, isn't it? Not, not whether or not a banana is bent or straight. Not whether or not a newsreader wears a headscarf. British values should really be looking at the profits we make from facilitating epic violations of humanitarian law. But we won't, and we don't, and I understand why. It's not, it's not sexy, it doesn't feel close. It doesn't feel uh, immediate, it doesn't feel relevant to our life. And 3.3 billion quid is 3.3 billion quid. But where does that leave us as a nation? Where does that leave our values? Where does that leave our moral, our claim to the moral high ground when we try to tell other civilizations, other countries, other societies that they're behaving in a, in a bad way? Seeing a lot of what about her at the moment with the Donald Trump, John Burko scenario. I, I told you that the papers would be even more vitriolic today than they were yesterday because it's so inextricably tied up in Brexit. Everybody who told you to vote to leave the European Union has to distract you from the fact that the reason why we have to kowtow to a man who is uh, in direct contravention of everything that could be described as a Western or a British value, they have to distract you from that fact because it's their fault that we're having to beg. We're, we're our Prime Minister, the most undignified sight I have ever seen in the history or in my political life, our Prime Minister kowtowing to a man who boasts about groping women. Kowtowing, cap in hand, and we had to. She had no choice. She's been boxed into that corner by Brexit. And of course, the people responsible for Brexit, the propagandists and the media owners, the billionaires and the uh, self-publicists, they can never, ever, ever admit that. Can they? Because it's our fault. It's our fault Theresa May has to go and hold hands with a self-confessed sex offender. He has to hold the hand he has boasted about using to grab women by their genitals. And Brexit put her there. She has accepted the role, of course. She didn't have to do that. She has embraced it in many ways, in a way that I think many of us find quite surprising. But that's why it's happening. 
And, and what you get with the John Burko stuff is all this moral whataboutery about him having tea with the North Koreans or uh, entertaining the King of Kuwait or whatever it might be. Because to focus on the sim single simple issue of why we are having to roll out a red carpet for such a despicable human being is to say, oh, well, it's our fault. So any, look, just look at it. Look at how it's covered. Don't look at what they're saying about Burko and Trump. Look at what they're saying about Brexit. And I will tell you, when you tell me what they said about Brexit, I'll tell you what they're saying about Burko and Trump. If they said yes to Brexit, they're saying Burko's outrageous and disgusting. And quick, look over there at, at a Kuwaiti king or a North Korean diplomat. Do not look at Donald Trump. Because the longer you look at Donald Trump, the more pennies are going to drop that we're in this horrible, embarrassing, undignified position as an entire flipping country because of what they told you to do in the run-up to the referendum. It is that simple. It really is. And I'm not criticising anybody, except the liars and the self-publicists and the propagandists. I'll criticise them until they drag me out of the studio kicking and screaming. I'm not criticising the people that believed it. But now they're telling you, the same people, don't look at Donald Trump. Quick, look over there at a Kuwaiti king. Quick, look over there at the Chinese president. Quick, look over there. Don't look at Donald Trump. Don't look at Donald Trump. Because the longer you look at Donald Trump, the more likely you are to ask yourself how the hell our wonderful country has been reduced to begging for favours from a man who not only lies through his teeth on a daily basis, but boasts about breaking the most simple of conventions that we as a country and as a people are supposed to hold dear. Can't hold him dear anymore. We're begging for crumbs from his table. Don't ask why. Do not ask why. There is nothing to see here. So Daily Mail devotes pages today to slagging off John Burko. Why? Well, what's the alternative? <laughs> Acknowledging he may have had a point. And if he had a point, what happens next? Why are we doing this? Why is our Prime Minister, why is the most senior elected politician in this land reduced to holding a hand whose owner has boasted of using it to grab women by the vagina? Answer, because she has to. I wasn't going to do any Trump today. Sorry. Let's get back to Saudi. And, and that, the, the reason I mention all of that is because of the moral greyness that has engulfed us. It's always been there, but we've somewhat naively kidded ourselves that there was a moral high ground, there was an ethical foreign policy. So I know now exactly what question I want to ask you. What is wrong with selling weapons to Saudi Arabia? 03456060973. Because against that backdrop of commercial desperation that has led us into the clutches of Donald Trump, I would add that 3.3 billion quid is a real and significant amount of money. All right, it's been spent on financing staggering, staggering violations of humanitarian law, but if we didn't do it, somebody else would. Just unpick that position for me, because right now, looking at the world, looking at this country, looking at the national interest, looking at the economic future, I'm not sure I can. 11.16 is the time. 03456060973 is the number you need. Just give me the absolute definitive explanation of why selling weapons to Saudi Arabia is wrong. Where the simple, and, and Peter in Lansing puts it very, very I, I, boldly, boldly actually, as in B-A-L-D-L-Y, rather than bold. Would you want to tell all the men and women employed in our, quote, and then brackets, he adds, immoral arms industry, you're all out of a job and you may well lose your house. That's the moral high ground. So, and someone sent me a link to, almost needless to say, to Boris Johnson punting the line that if we didn't sell arms to Saudi Arabia, um, other countries would happily step into the breach and, and trouser all the moolah. Uh, he also claimed that it would end Britain's diplomatic influence in the conflict at a stroke. This after the government was heavily criticised in recent months over constant reports that British-made weapons are being used in these alleged war crimes in Yemen. Uh, nothing alleged about the MOD finding staggering violations of humanitarian law. And in court yesterday, um, it was reported that a senior civil servant warned Sajid Javid, the business secretary, to that the, the, the um, weapons were being used in human rights abuses, but he ignored the advice from a senior civil servant. Any thought you've got at all on this? It is kind of like a moral dilemma, but one which also has to admit practicalities. And Boris Johnson sounds pretty grim when he says that, but I can see some sense in what he's saying. Fahad is in Ealing. Sorry to keep you, Fahad. What would you like to say? Oh, hi there, James. Hello. Morning. Hello, mate. Uh, I'd just like to uh, share my experience, really, because yes. I was actually there in Yemen when the whole thing kicked off. 
Um, just to give you a brief summary, I left the UK a few years ago yes. uh, to go work as an English teacher. Um, I had got married out there. Um, in in that, Yemen? Anyway. Do, you, do you have some sort of Yemeni heritage? Yes, yeah. My mother is from Aden. Okay. Um, former British colony. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I went out there and I was out there in Sana'a, which was the capital. I was working as an English teacher and I was there when the Houthis actually brought all their army into Sana'a to come under the pretext of we're doing a demonstration yes. to, to, you know, because against the petrol prices or something like that. Uh, barely a couple of weeks later, they'd taken over the city. Now they overthrew, the they overthrew the, it's an, an elected government, was it, prior to that or was it a sort um, of... It, it, well, it was elected. I mean, when the revolution happened, you yeah. know, back in 2011, they got rid of the old president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, and they, and they gave power to his vice president, Abdul Rabbul Mansour Hadi. Mm. Um, he's a, whatever people have got to say about him, he's still the legitimate government. You can't just come over and, you know, and, and no, yeah, absolutely. the jungle. Yes, I understand that. And, and take over. So what happened, and, and I still remember the, clearly the night, March 25th, 2015, when, when they came, the Saudis and the Emiratis and the whole Gulf just started pounding away. I went out and recorded it, and it was just the whole sky was lit up. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. God. You know? Are you scared? It was... Of course, uh, well, to be quite honest with you, uh, it was surreal. I, yeah. I wasn't really... Like being on a scared. film set, almost. Exactly. And my, and my wife, because my wife, who was, believe it or not, she was pregnant at that time. Oh, um, yeah, and, and we had no family in Sonar, so we are like, what are we going to do? We need to go down to Aden. We've yes. got family there. Little did we know that when we were going to go down to Aden, but um, at the end of the day, I'm still a foreigner. I've got a British passport, yeah. and I don't look Yemeni because on my father's side, believe it or not, oh. ironically, he's Pakistani. <laughs> All right? Yeah. So, so it was just like a Hollywood movie. We went down to Aden. Aden was much worse. You know, there was, uh, there was street fighting going on over there and they were pounding from above, which was different to what was going on in Sana. Um, Houthis, they were just killing civilians. And cause I got a doctor, uh, I got a job with Doctors Without Borders out mm. in Aden. So I got to see a lot of stuff on the front line. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was terrible. And my wife had to give birth out there. It was difficult. I've been back in the UK. But just about it's exactly a year now. Um, my wife and daughter are not here with me, unfortunately, because there's no government out there. There's no embassies. There's nothing. Good job I've got my daughter's British passport, and I'm actually working now to try and get my wife out of there and my daughter out of there. Good grief. Um, now going back to the Saudis yes. selling weapons. Now, um, it, as a layman, I'd say no, they shouldn't be. Why? Because I can guarantee you those bombs are landing in places where they should not be landing. Yes. Um, and I've got proof of that. You know, I remember Eid in 2015, me and my cousin were going after the morning prayers. We went for a drive to go get lunch. And there were a whole bunch of people gathering around a big object in the middle of a bridge. I was like, I wonder what they're doing. So we went and we saw it was an unexploded missile. I can't believe how cool you are. You're talking yeah, to, if someone's just turned on the radio now and they're not quite sure what the subject is, they might think you're talking about going to the football last weekend. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. And, then, and, and I actually <laughs> went out, I took a photo. I, I, believe it or not, I actually went and did what they were doing. I sat on it because I said to my cousin, you can't do these things before you die. You, know? you sat on the bomb? I, yeah, unexploded. I've got the video at home. Did you well. say, does my bomb look big in this? That. Yeah, <laughs> does my bite? Yeah, this is well. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to document was I, the, the, the serial numbers. They, these were manufactured by BA Systems, oh, you know. And I was just like, whoa! Like you know, and and and, I, and as much as I love, you know, I love my country, UK, mm -hmm. everything. But I, I just feel they didn't do anything to help the British citizens at that time to get out. It's not either or. It's not either or. Yeah. I, I mean, for you yeah. it is, clearly, and I'm certainly not going to try and dissuade you from that position, but the, 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 the ability to exercise diplomatic influence is, is defined by the relationship with Saudi. Exactly. And, and exactly. It, it, it may well be that they were doing more behind the scenes than you realise, but it certainly didn't feel like that to you, and I, yeah, I, I have it, only respect exactly. for that position. Exactly. And then when I came back to the UK, I just thought to myself, well, hold on a second, the reality, a lot of change here, and I was shocked with the whole 5p bag thing, you know, that was... Uh, that <laughs> You so just like, sat on an unexploded bomb in the middle yeah. of Yemen, and you come back here and you go, you yeah. get gets your goat that you have to pay five p for a plastic bag. I love you, mate. That, that, there you go. Yeah. That's British values for you in a nutshell. Yeah, I, I can't believe it. And then so so going, you know, and then it just to me, it was I'm just a layman looking. I don't know what budgets are. I don't, sure. I don't know. So when I'm looking at making three billion pounds or whatever this that this that, and I'm seeing at home they're making cuts in the NHS and you mm. know social services, whatever it may be. I think to myself, well, there's still is none of my business, but they're going out bombing in Syria and these bombs cost a lot of money. 
to 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 so uh, to me i'm just like hold on a second you're making cuts at home but you're spending 250,000 pounds on a single missile to go bomb somewhere we don't need no to they're flogging yeah. it to the saudis we're making profit yeah. on that bomb they are. I mean, why, do, why, why don't we just make them yachts and cars and, you know, give them some transsexuals really. or whatever that they love, you know. That, that <laughs> right, steady on, mate. Just... Out there, you know, <laughs> you know why, why don't we just do that? Well, we don't. We don't. We're not. We, we don't. That bottom line, we don't. I mean, and if we did have, so I think Aston Martin is still British owned, isn't it? I, 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 maybe a couple of others. Yeah, like, yeah, well, Rolls -Royce and we do. And we sell that as well. And Rolls-Royce made the engines for the planes that drop the bombs, perhaps. But, but it just in terms, because you mentioned the Houthis a lot and they've done some pretty vile things. They have, they have. I mean, but at the end of the day, you got to look at it like this. It's like the lesser of two evils. Everybody's blaming Saudi Arabia. I blame them for a chunk of what's gone on over the last year and a half. Yes. However, you can't forget what started this. The Houthis had no right to come. Well, that, know, no, but this is my it. point. So, so we, you know, we presume there's can't. a moral black and white. There isn't here. Y exactly. And in the grey area, in your own words, what's wrong with selling weapons to Saudi Arabia? There's just got to be more regulation. Yeah. That's all it is. I mean, for example, look, I, don't, I'm, I just think of analogy here. For example, you got you got um, some meat shops in London saying we're selling halal meat, yeah. you know, and you and you find out they're not selling halal meat, or whether it's a Jewish shop selling kosher meat, and you find out that meat is not kosher, and then you go to the slaughterhouse, the people are in charge and giving these certificates, and you see that no, they're not. You know, it, it's something similar like that. You're selling them whatever weapons. Have some sort of regulation. See what they're doing. And that leads us. That leads us. Dick and Harry. No, that leads us absolutely towards the towards the. the the, the, the court case that's being heard at the moment. Um, I mean, it really does. It's, it's quite remarkable that you put it like that because Sajid Javid effectively said, yes, there is, uh, there was uncertainty and gaps in the knowledge available, but we're going to press on with the weapons licenses anyway. Problem is, of course, that if you brought in these checks and balances and insisted that Saudi Arabia prove that they aren't using these weapons in the commission of alleged war crimes, Saudi Arabia probably would just turn around and say, nah, we'll buy them off someone who's, who's, who's not going to check. You know, we'll buy them off, we'll buy them off Boise down at the, <laughs> down at the nag's head. He can sort us out. Fahad, I wish you well. I, I mean, it sounds like you've got a very steep mountain to climb to get your wife and, and daughter into Britain. And I imagine things are getting harder given the political landscape on both sides of the Atlantic. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It is. It is. It is tricky, but I've got, you know, I've got a local MP involved. I've got a lot of support. You know, I'm doing things the right way. And, um, you know, things, 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 are, things are going the right way. Good. Yeah, I'm definitely. very glad to hear it. And I, and I really do wish you well. The, the, the idea of my little girl being in a war zone and me being unable to kiss her every night or, or, or to get her out of there. Well, you know, makes my heart bleed. I appreciate that's becoming a very unfashionable position. It's coming up to half past 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Yeah, we'll struggle to follow that, but don't be put off because we're talking about the moral quandary here as much as the military reality. I think uh, Fahad's covered the military reality to a level that none of us could have done. What, what, to put it up against that text from Peter, simply saying all these people, I don't know how many there are, but they are British industries, British companies, British factories. Probably they'd have to close if we didn't sell this stuff to Saudi. And it seems like a disgusting suggestion that, that, you know, there's a trade-off here, but but actually, that's what diplomacy is. Can anyone make a definitive, absolutely cast-iron case for ceasing these arms sales? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Very different conversation from the one we had in the last hour, and you got a much better chance of getting through to the program, largely because it's a much more complicated question. It's the most complicated question of all, in many ways. Uh, uh, at what point does the clear? benefit to our national interest that comes from selling weapons to Saudi Arabia become overshadowed by the moral transgression that we appear to be party to. I, I don't know, but I think when I said, is it really as simplistic and silly as saying, if we don't do it, then someone else will? Because that way you can justify selling crack cocaine to children. It's more complicated than that. Uh, you, you, but I, didn't, I, I hope I'm not going to sound like some sort of apologist now. There's plenty of stuff on YouTube of me interviewing Saudi and, uh, uh, and in fact, one Tory MP who was very much fighting the Saudi corner. So I've, I've got my ducks in a row. I just do see some sense in the suggestion that by dint of being the vendor of these arms, we, is this going to make me sound nuts? We're closer to the action than we would otherwise be and can therefore seek to influence Saudi in a way that we simply couldn't do if we weren't selling them the weapons. And it's true, I think, to say that if we didn't, somebody else would. So are we patting ourselves on the back for, for our moral gumption here while selling them weapons that are used in the commission of alleged war crimes? I think we are. But that's the thing about politics. 
We're living in an era now where everybody thinks it's binary and black and white, good, bad, black, white. It's not. It's really dirty and complicated, and that's why it has historically been done by quite complex and often very boring people. The age of Donald Trump is an age where we pretend these things are really simple. They're not. And the more complicated they are, the more I can see sense in the suggestion that, well, it's not just the money, it's the proximity, the influence. Would Saudi Arabia be even worse if we weren't in the back seat? I don't know. It's a thought, though, no? Dilly's in Hounslow. Dilly, what would you like to say? Well, hi there. I'd just like to say that, uh, first of all, make no mistake about it, that Saudi Arabia has got some serious human rights issues. <laughs> well, if you look at the same, same, if you look at the other side of, of the coin, is the influence of Iran in the region. We have seen that for decades in, uh, with Hezbollah. Uh, we've seen, seen that in Bahrain, destab destabilizing the region. And now it's in Yemen, which they're arming. It's a proxy war, are you suggesting? It's a proxy it's war between war. Iran and Saudi Arabia, with Iran arming the Houthis and, and yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think the way that if you look back in history in the, in the region, I think Iran has been playing dirty games all, all along with the, the help of Hezbollah and, you know, all those. What, 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 what's your, I need to know your background, if you don't mind. I need to know whether you have a dog in this race. I don't have a dog in this race. Uh, I'm, I'm born and brought up in Dubai, but my actual background is from Pakistan. Okay. And I've seen the region grow. Uh, I've seen a lot of things happen good as well. Yes. I've changed a, lo a lot, especially in, in Dubai. In, you know, that's one region that has been massive improvements. Yeah, I, well, I mean, these these things are all relative. I still I still wouldn't want to be a a, a, a foreign building worker there. There's no black and white in this. No, I I get that. Just just pause for a second because we are dis. I mean, I appreciate, and we did. I was at pains with Farhad to to point out that there are atrocities on both sides, and you you remind us that the Houthis are sponsored, supported by by uh, the Iranian regime, but we are not selling the bombs to the Iranians. That that's why the conversation has gone in the direction that it's gone. It's about the moral dilemma that the British government and by association the British yeah, people face. I agree with then we had the same issue in Iraq as well where there was no right and wrong and the moral issue was that whether we keep him or we don't keep him. Hmm. Saddam Hussein. And that, that was a decision taken by the British government to remove him and you know again it's, it's a region where there's no such thing as black and white. Again, in German, there are some serious human rights. So, so are you are you comfortable then with the with the sale of pretty heavy duty ordnance? I think to I think to face with Iran, I think we should support the Saudis and the pro European pro Western countries. Saudi Arabia has never stood up and said that we're going to wipe Iran out of the surface of the earth, Iran has. So we need to be careful as to what we say. So the, you, you, you are pretty much giving me a textbook description of choosing between the lesser of two evils, right? Exactly, absolutely, right. Yeah. absolutely. But do we have to sell them weapons? We could we could choose a side, and we could choose what we think is the lesser of two evils. But do we have? How would you? How would you? Yeah. How about how would you? How would you tackle uh, the the tribal terrorist organisations in? Yemen, because they're get, they're getting all the farm, arms and all the cash fundings from Iran, and they're creating absolutely big problems in the region. And the only way to counterattack is someone goes and actually. But they don't have. <coughs> excuse uh, me. They don't have to counterattack with with stuff that's got you know Union Jack kite mark printed on the back of it. I'll just read you a quick line, if I may. Let me just double check where this is from because these things are important. From Middle East Eye, which is a very interesting news outlet. The British government ignored the advice of its own arms control experts and refused to suspend the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. This is what the court heard yesterday. And, and that phrase that our own arms control experts. So I, I'm not going to pick a hole in anything that you've said. It's quite dispiriting and bleak, but that, that's usually the case when you move away from the binary analysis of the news. What's the point of having our own arms control experts if our government is going to ignore them? Well, again, I don't have 
the facts. I don't, well, you do now. I don't That's what happened. I, Senior civil I, servant at the I, Department of Business, Innovation and Skills yeah. warned against continued exports a year ago. Again, I don't have the facts in front of me. I can only say what I see on TV, what I see on news, and what I little read on in the newspaper, that, and what I have seen myself over the years, the influence of Iran in the region, and how destabil destabil destabilizing is that in the region. And I think there is, to counter, to put Iran on the back seat, someone has to take responsibility. I'm glad you were listening today. I really am. And that, that is, you know, testament to, 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 to the quality of calls. I have to do a slight little uh, apology to the quality of my commentary. I, I suggested Aston Martin, just off the top of my head, might be British owned. It's not. It's owned by a, a, a consortium that includes Ford, um, a Kuwaiti investment uh, fund and an Italian investment fund. I was just talking about uh, British British manufacturers. In fact, Dilly, thank you. What's the time? 11.42. Um, I'll talk to Sarah first, and then I'll just run you through the uh, top 10 quotes, British, end quotes, car companies, and we'll work out whether any of them are actually British. And this is relevant, of course, to any trade deals that we may strike up with our new friend in the White House. Sarah is in Tunbridge. Sarah, what would you like to say? Well, I'd be interested what the 10 uh, British... Uh, all right. Uh, do you want me to talk British you through values it? Values are values. We're oh, always values. We're going on our British, yes. our British values. Um, yes. You know, well, we I, well, you say we are. Usually it's sort of demagogues, rabble-rousers, and attention-seeking sort of freaks that do that. Most of us know well, what it I means. Well, I mean, I've heard, I've heard, well, perhaps that's what Cameron was, yes. Mm. I mean, he, he stood up in, in Parliament saying that, all these people. Um, I, I'm, I'm much more simplistic than your other folk who yes. see who see both sides. <clears throat> I believe if you, just like in America, if you have guns, people will get shot. Um, and more people get shot in a week there than they do in this country in probably five years. And so it goes on. We sell arms because they make money. I find it absolutely disgusting that our one of our main industries is the arms industry. And when people like um, uh, uh, Boris Johnson say, well, if we didn't, somebody else would, yeah. I could scream. Why? Well, it's true. why don't we, in which case, if, if the argument always is, if we didn't, somebody else will, hmm. why don't we get into the porn industry? We are. It would make a hell of a lot of money. We are in it. There's a VAT on pornography. And, you know, we could regulate... Hey, don't just gloss over my zinger, porn? Sarah. I'm just glossing over my zinger. Illegal pornography, we do make money out of. Uh, what, we make money out of illegal? No, legal. The stuff that's legal. You don't make money out of the illegal stuff. Uh, no, no, what I'm talking about... Let's, let's, let's just hey, have steady. government buy in, in the uh, same with street drugs. Let's not Alcohol, have nicotine. We, have. we make millions out of alcohol and nicotine. Yeah, but all, um, I said street drugs. Yeah, I know you did, but... They're, they're appalling, they're, 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 which are frankly no different from any of the others. You see, but you know, see it is a grey area. It is nuanced. Why? Well, because the government know. does make a lot of money out of doing things that harm us already. Well, of course they, do. of course they do. But I, I'm, I, my argument is I don't think it's a very good idea when there are things that are going to kill people, or you know, use people as sex machines or whatever else. Sex I think machines. it's absolutely sex. appalling. Well, I, I and I do as well at first glance. But at second glance, what's the alternative? We pull the plug. We lose. Well, we're not. We're not. We're, we're, then we're not the civilized. People, no, hang on. So I didn't. I, 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 hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. We pull the plug, and setting aside the commercial impact of that, which I'm happy to do because I think it would be very difficult to argue with you on the straight moral versus material battle. I mean, we, why are we doing something so horribly immoral? We're doing it for money, James. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll give you that one. But by dint of being the supplier, we are closer to the country of Saudi Arabia than we would otherwise be. And, and it's a question then, Sarah, it's a very personal question of whether or not you believe a politician, any politician, whether it's Robin Cook right through the moral gamut over to Boris Johnson, when, yeah. when they say, well, this actually, it's not ideal, but it does give us a chance to actually influence events in the region in a way that we would not be able to do if we weren't selling them great big bombs. But why do we want to influence them? Because um, there's a civil yeah, war and we'd like it to stop. Said, said something about um, we, we, meaning us in the West, yes. should sort out Iran. I thought, why? It, it, 
you know, why are we so superior, we white folk in the in the in the West, mm. going to sort out everybody else? I'm sick of us being the the supposedly good guys when we have done appalling things ourselves all over the world for centuries. And you know, it wasn't really that long ago. I'm coming up for 72. I lived in America when I was 10. Mm. There was still segregation even in Washington D.C. Yeah, yeah. I lived in Virginia where you had what you know a fountains for white people where the idea that that was the brilliant democracy when half the you could not get married to a black person in in the south up to 1965 i mean this is the country that we admire they had prohibition they had mccarthyism they they invaded um vietnam they did agent orange and they're our best friends i mean oh, that's no way to talk about the new president sorry that's no way to talk about the new president and it's just gone on and on and I, on. Well, I, and, and so have you, in a good way. I don't mean that as a criticism. I'm late for the travel news, that's all. And, and I think you've crystallised something I've been puzzling over as well, which is why I'm so cross with the British political establishment's response to Donald Trump. And it's because of everything Sarah's just described. America has always had this bubbling under the surface. It's always had the capability to turn the clock back to the days where you can't marry someone according to your skin colour. We've always been better than that. Always. Always, always, always. Until Brexit forced our Prime Minister to prostrate herself at the feet of a man who represents all of the appalling practices that Sarah just described. Let's just do this quickly, then we'll cross to Ali and Walthamstow, because it, it, a lot of people have been talking about trade and deals we can do, and uh, there's that great text yesterday, I don't know if you heard it, pointing out that the approximate difference, I'm going to get the number wrong, so fill in the gaps yourself, the approximate difference in distance between Munich, which is roughly the geographical centre of the European Union or the European continent, you're looking at about 2,000, over 2,500 extra miles of transport for, for, for a new market in, for example, America. And one of the things that, that people have told me, um, usually in rather frenzied tweets, is that we can sell them our cars. Okay, which cars? Because I thought Aston Martin was British. Nope, that's uh, American, Kuwaiti and Italian owned. Bentley? Bentley? It's owned by Volkswagen, which is, of course, German. Jaguar? Yep, that's Indian. Uh, Lotus, come on, Lotus. I drive past the light. Like, no, Malaysian. MG, I like MGs. Do you remember when they did the MG badge on the Metro? I love those little cars. Anyway, that's Chinese. The Mini, of course, BMW, Germany. Um, we've got one in at number eight, Morgan. Okay, the only remaining family-owned, independent, innovative British motor manufacturer. And it produces several hundred cars each year. That's, that's the only one. Rolls-Royce, German, Vauxhall. I didn't even know Vauxhall was ever British, but it was it was bought by General Motors, an American company, back in 1925. And what was very good for us and for British manufacturing is when General Motors in the late 2000s gave a massive boost to the Vauxhall brand by moving the production of the Astra to the UK. Thank God America hasn't got a president now who's boasting about the fact that he's going to insist that American companies keep all their manufacturing in America, because that would be really awkward. Ali's in Walthamstow. Speaking of awkward, Ali, take me back to Saudi. Hello, James. Hello, Ali. Um, first time calling to your show. Very welcome. Um, all right, James, you know this argument about um, if we don't do anything, uh, uh, if we don't support somebody against Iran, Iran's going to spread its, spread its tentacles and all that business. Well, the thing is, we've been supporting... Uh, Saudi Arabia since the Saudi royal family came to power, I think mm. in the early 1900s. And right or wrong, we've, whatever they've done right, whatever they've done wrong, we've always been backing them and so have the US. Now what happens, um, we support them, they get brave, and then what happens, they spread their fields right to other countries. My family is from Pakistan, my, my parents emigrated to UK from Pakistan. And Saudi Arabia and Iran, They've been carrying on. They've been uh, having a proxy war in Pakistan since for for a long, long time. They've been doing it in Syria as well. They've been. Well, what are they? For, forgive my ignorance. What what are they fighting over? So if you have ir Iranian backed, who, who who does Iran back in the in the Pakistani theatre? Um, sh sort of militant Shia groups. Okay, and Saudi Arabia backs. And militant Wahhabi groups who use the term as Sunnis. So they're, they're portrayed to the world as this is a civil war between Sunnis and Shias, but it's not a civil war between Sunnis and Shias. It's a civil war between fundamentalist Shias and fundamentalist Wahhabis. And I don't like using the term Sunnis for these okay. guys because they've hijacked the label. And what it is, it's an intra sort of sectarian conflict um, and the innocents get uh, 
slaughtered in, uh, on both sides. Same things happen in Syria. Same things happen in Yemen. Yes. So no, we shouldn't be selling. We shouldn't be selling um, weapons to these guys because the, everybody can see it, apart from the people in power, the people in um, big business. Everyone can see exactly what Saudi Arabia is doing and exactly what Iran is doing. They're both as bad as each other. Yeah, but but um, what happens if we pull out then? Because Iran is is, is mostly going to be Kremlin backed, right? If, if their their superpower support comes from Russia, uh huh, and Saudi Arabia's comes from Britain and America. Um, well, so you you pull out the superpower support, and, and sadly we're not a superpower. We've only got Morgan. Yeah, but we're not, James. We're not doing it to make the. Do you think we're doing it right to to stop Iran, or we're doing it to make a quick buck? We're doing it to make a quick buck, and <laughs> we, then, then we can use that same. Argument. I love the. I love the way you're. you're you, I mean, uh, you've got me over a, over a barrel, mate. Because like, I, I mean, I, 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 I know my naivety is just spectacular on this issue, isn't it? It's just this idea that when Boris Johnson says it means we can exercise diplomatic influence in the area. And I'm saying maybe that's true, and you're laughing at me. Rubbish, rubbish. <laughs> if we pull out of selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, we can use their argument and say, well, we ain't going to sell to the Saudis, we can go and sell it to someone else. Yeah, you know, we can go and sell it to the North Koreans or, or anyone else, you know. It's not, it's not about, you know, stabilizing the region. If you wanted to stabilize the region, you don't pour petrol on, on an on a inferno that's already, you know, burning to put the flames out. You don't. You've got to use diplomatic means. You've got to, you know, everyone's got to pull together. The only people that are benefiting out of this is big businesses, uh, the arms dealer, uh, dealers, I mean, and the fundamentalists. The fundamentalists, get, they get weapons. And you know what? I wonder how many of these weapons have fallen into the hands of so-called sort of, um, you know, heart-munching liberals, uh, uh, moderate rebels in Syria. <laughs> heart-munching liberals. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I hear you. So we just, what, we wash our hands of it completely? Completely wash your hands with it, and you know, don't, don't. Uh, and and to the people who lose their jobs as a result, I, 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 you would say, I suspect, well, at least you're not losing your life, which is what would have happened to somebody exactly, on the other side of the world if you carried exactly, on. Exactly, exactly. I mean, one person loses their job here, uh, you know, fifty lives will get saved, you know, a thousand miles away. Yeah, but look at the world we live in. I think people, people, have, people like me have been very surprised at, at the, the the sort of cultivation, almost the fetishization of callousness. I could stand up now if I was built in the right way and say, I don't care if 50 Arabs die. If, if one British job is saved, I don't care if 50 Arabs die. And I never would have thought this possible two years ago, but the world I live in now, the country I live in now, the radio station I work for now, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said that before, uh, before the weekend. But it's been happening since, uh, you know, people always, uh, people put money, put profits before, you know, the well-being of the human race. And they just allow, they allow snowflakes like me to, to, to spout a bit for now. Because we they kind of we, we just put a we put a coat of paint on that ancient truth and pretend that we've got moral repercussions or moral quandaries, but rubbish, in fact, rubbish. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, James. <laughs> I mean, no one's. Uh... Oh man, alive! I've got a full switchboard now, and I'm moving on to happy marriages next. Any advice on a happy marriage, Ali? Uh, I'm in a happy marriage. I'm in a happy. I've been in a happy marriage for a long, long time. So I'm. Just, what's your secret? Right, what, what's your secret? <laughs> just be yourself. Just, just be, be real. Be yourself. You're joking, aren't you? Be, be honest. I'd be honest. Be honest and be yourself. I'd have been divorced by Christmas. Uh, the conversation we're going to have, PMQ's on the way, of course, at 12.45. Ali, you'd look after yourself. My apologies to everybody waiting, to Ashley and to Ahmed and to David and to Jason and to Adam and to Ronnie, Atik and others. We, we've returned to that, actually. It was a slow start to that, but uh, this is often the way with the complicated questions. The brilliant calls inspired everybody else's little grey cells to start whirring. I